Hello, friends and listeners. In today's episode, we are extremely proud to have our guest, Tony Vincent. After 12 years of self-employment, he returned to classroom teaching for the 2018 to 2019 school year and taught fifth graders at College View Elementary School. Now back to being self-employed, doing what he can to help teachers. He has been a pioneer in digital learning. Since 1998, having the classroom website before many classrooms even had internet access. Wow. In 2001, he had a one-to-one -one classroom with Palm Pilots. And in 2005, his first podcast from an elementary school. Very impressive. After teaching fifth grade for six years, he joined helping his colleagues integrate technology and was his school's technology coach for a couple more. In 2006, he became self-employed consultant and traveled globally to facilitate workshops and to make presentations for K-12 educators and students. Over the years, he has authored books, product videos, developed an iPad app, and blogged about learning and technology, all in an effort to support great teaching and deeper learning. Tony, welcome to our show. Let's talk computer science. Excellent. It's good to be here. Why did you choose to become a teacher and then an advocate for education technology? Uh, you know, I love to help people. And like a lot of teachers, I decided at a young age I was going to be a teacher. I was inspired by a lot of the teachers that I had as a kid and also the some of the non-examples that I had, like, oh, I could be a better teacher than that. So it was sixth grade. I From sixth grade on, I knew that teaching was my career choice. So I paid attention to every teacher I had and made mental notes about like, well, one, one day when I'm, I'm a teacher, I'm going to do it that way, or I'm going to do it the other way. And at the same time, I've always been geeky since I was uh, nine years old. And my uncle gave me this hand-me-down computer that actually saved data to cassette tapes. Uh, and I, the way I would code was from a magazine and you'd copy the code from the magazine on this little tiny keyboard and save it to this cassette. I was fascinated. I loved using it. So uh, it's kind of kind of fortunate that being a teacher, I could use technology. And as the years went on, as you heard in my bio, there was more and more kinds of technology available that I could use that to to teach and to help kids learn and nowadays help teachers learn so they can help students. Yep, yeah, in 1998, you had a classroom website. That's impressive. That probably you did completely with HTML, right? Like there was no shortcuts like now. Like, oh, it was, it was not easy, but there, there, were some, there were some software that you could use to kind of make it, but yeah, the, there was no Google, so I remember they had a Yahoo instead of searching back then, because there were so few websites, you would just go by category. So you go to education, K-12 elementary websites. There were like two, like my website and another. Talked a little bit about how technology is being used nowadays in the education space. Well, you know, with, with pandemic teaching, it's really been been used as a key communication device. Uh, I have twins that are in second grade and they're doing all of second grade virtually, uh, actually in the other room right now. And their technology lets them see their teacher during meetings. It lets them access their virtual classroom. They're watching videos by their teachers and by other people. Uh, it is their portal into the school. Uh, like so many kids nowadays and it's also their canvas they do a lot of creating you know, when they have spare time um, my kids are kind of geeky like me they make their own slideshows and they're drawing their own digital pictures wow. and they go and they make something out of scratch they 
the it's their creation device as well. And that's the way it's used in a lot of schools before pandemic teaching is it is this great creative creativity tool. It has the potential to be just a testing tool and take multiple choice tests all day. But, uh, you know, really good teachers, passionate teachers and passionate students, they they find ways to use their technology in um, some of the most robust, interesting, awesome ways. Do you recommend one on one? Yeah, you know, particularly with with pandemic teaching, every kid needs their computer to be able to to participate if they're not at school or learning from home. But also just having your own device, that's the, the way the, the world works. I mean, I can't imagine if I had to share my computer uh, with somebody when I have work or learning to do that day. Uh, you know, one-to-one, -one, when I started teaching in, in 98, it definitely wasn't the norm. And you heard in my bio that we went one-to-one -one with Palm Pilots, which are these little digital organizers. You poked at the screen with a stylus. There was a limited set of apps, but we had some apps that students could organize themselves. They could create these little animations by drawing on the screen. They can make their own little uh, eBooks that I saw the power of when they each had this creation device in, in their hands, they could do a lot. So um, I definitely think one-to-one -one is the way to go. And as a teacher too, when I went back to the classroom, I had one-to-one -one Chromebooks with my students and I just can't imagine if that wasn't the case. If we had to roll in a cart and use them sometimes, like that's really hard to put into your flow of teaching. Like that, that's just a, a roadblock that you know if if one-to-one -one is possible then the teacher doesn't have to worry about the timing and the placement of the computers because every kid has one so in my experience being a mom uh, i've heard like other moms saying like uh, they do not like this one-to-one -one initiatives that they're giving their kids being ex making their kids exposed to technology be more and way before they're ready. How would you respond to that? I think, you know, it's screen time. It is a concern. Kids should be out exploring the world and experiencing other things. I definitely don't want kids in front of a screen all the time, but I do like having one available. So I, when it's needed and, you know, not all screen time is created the same, you know, it's screen time where kids are just passively watching videos all day long or just playing some mindless games you know, that that's not equal to if they're using it as i said before to create to author you know multimedia books and maybe they're making their own videos and taking their learning and turning it into something else that's valuable screen time and uh and one-to-one -one definitely helps with that so it's got to be a balance. Yeah. So can you give some recommendations if a school needs to implement a one-to-one, -one, like in terms of uh, grade levels, what kind of devices? Yeah. You know, I own an iPad. I stood in line to get the first iPhone and the first iPad. Uh, I am mostly a Macintosh user. And then my students had Chromebooks. And I'm, I'm all for whatever platform the school can get, what they can afford, and what they have the expertise on board for, right? Um, managing iPads is different than managing Chromebooks. And some districts, they pull it off. They have iPads for younger kids, and they have Chromebooks for some of the, the, the older ones. I kind of, you know, if, you, if there's an iPad involved in the one-to-one, -one, I hope there are keyboards too. Um, I, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I think keyboarding is an important skill. And, you know, it, even if you are doing some coding, having the keyboard there is, is kind of a key piece instead of typing just on the glass. Uh, 
you know, I can see iPads being used better for younger kids and, and Chromebooks for older, but I can also see everybody using iPads or everybody using Chromebooks, particularly now that there are so many Chromebooks that are touchscreen. Um, but if there's a Windows PC uh, laptop in there or a Mac, I think it, I think it's all good. But it just the key is that there has to be support there. You have to have expertise in your school or in your district to support whatever platform you end up going with. Let's switch gears and talk about your projects. So what kind of projects are you working on lately? Ah, well, I'm always uh, like giving webinars or uh, presentations, but uh, a side, well, it was meant to be a side project, but it's kind of turned into or taken over all of my time and it's called Shapegrams. And this came out of teaching fifth grade a couple of years ago and wanting my students to get these digital drawing skills. I've, I've always loved drawing and art and I love drawing with the computer. And once I figured out that I, if I looked at something and, and kind of analyzed and looked at what shapes were there, I could recreate that on my computer. Like I remember I was uh, younger and when the new nutrition labels came out, they're not new anymore. So this is a long time ago, but I remember going to my computer and like, I could make my own nutrition label and I can make it say anything I want because I can see what shapes make up these labels. So uh, being, I thought I want my kids to have these skills because I use these, the digital drawing skills to make social media posts, to make slideshows, uh, to, I use it in my videos. It's so valuable for me. That how can I help my kids get these same skills? So I developed uh, uh, Shapegrams where every, for me, it was every Wednesday. Every Wednesday morning, my fifth graders checked their Google Classroom and there was a new document for them to get a copy of. And on one side of the canvas, there's a picture to recreate, like the first one was a house. And on the other side is a blank area for them to recreate it. And it was so successful. It was a challenge. It was like a puzzle. It got them thinking. They had to order shapes and figure out what shapes made up the picture. They had to get the fill color and there's so much learning. And having one of these every week all school year really just did wonders for what my kids could do on their computer. They, this was done in Google drawings, but those same exact drawing tools are in Google Slides. So they're making these cool slideshows really awesome animations. They were creating posters and flyers and stuff all from scratch because they had these amazing skills by just doing a one little drawing challenge a week that, that got a little harder and harder and harder. So when I left the classroom after that year, I thought, these shapegrams are awesome. I've got to bring it to, to more classrooms. So uh, I started shapegrams.com and uh, Every week for a year, I put a new one on there. And now every two weeks, there's still another new one. So I have, I just posted my 50th. So there are 50 of these drawing challenges. And I beef them up from when I was in the classroom. So now each one has an instructional video, which that's the part that takes me longer than anything else is to make the video, the giving them tips and clues and directions on drawing what they're going to draw. The video also gets them interested in what they're going to draw. So it, it kind of, gives a backstory if we're looking like there's a picture of Jane Goodall. So I talk about Jane Goodall and her history and then they get to draw her. And then after they draw, they can put their own spin on their drawing. And that's the part I love seeing on social media. Like teachers are posting these pictures uh, of what students have created. And then I also love hearing teachers just rave about the skills that their kids ha have got because they have participated in Shapegrams. The, the because they take me so much time, it is a membership website, but the first four are free. And even if you just do the first four and no more, uh, the teachers tell me how much the kids' skills have improved just by recreating this house, this face, ice cream, and lion picture. Uh, and it is a fun way to learn, and, and I have a fun time making them, which is, you can tell, because I won't stop talking about them. <laughs> <laughs> it's the project that's really taken taken over my life the last couple of years in a good way. You seem to be very passionate about it. So uh, 
I would love to go and check it out. So it's shapegrams.com? Shapegrams.com, yep. And click that get button and uh, see if you can draw the house. That house looks easy to me now, but when my fifth graders first did it, so many of them wanted to give up. Like they were so frustrated. And that's why in the in the, every Shade Graham video I have, I, I, I love dad jokes and puns. So I put tons of jokes and puns into every Shade Graham video. But I have, you know, like, you can, you can do it. I give them a growth mindset message in every video because my kids did get frustrated when they got stuck. But at the end of the year, when we went back to look at that house, like, Mr. Vincent, why were we... Why were we having such a problem with that house? Like they could recreate that house in like 60 seconds at the end of the year. Because you've grown, right? You've learned. Wow, that sounds really interesting. Uh, yeah, I would like to go and check it out and share it with my kids and my teachers. So in addition to shapegrams.com, like what other services do you provide? Yeah, well, I think another thing that takes up a lot of my time is just posting on, on social media. Um, I've been on Twitter since 2007 <laughs> and, and I have an Instagram and a Facebook and you can find all those at learninginhand.com, my website, learninginhand.com, the social media links are at the top, but those I, I offer, um, I like to make graphics about tech tips and I know teachers are so busy. They don't have time to necessarily read a whole long blog post. Uh, so I try to make them short and sweet, kind of just like little bite-sized tech tips. And so that's what I tend to put on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook or links to something new. And I'm glad it can help other people out. But the real reason I do it is because it keeps me on my toes. I get to learn a new tool or tip and trying to explain it in 240 characters or in a concise graphic makes me really think about the tool and understand it myself. So can you repeat the website? It's learninhand.com? Learninginhand.com. Learning, sorry, learninginhand.com, shapegrams.com. Yep. And can you also let us know about your handles on the social media, how to find you? Yeah, uh, Tony Vincent on Twitter, Tony Vincent on, nope, Tony, just Tony Vincent on Twitter and then on Instagram and Facebook, it's learning in hand. And then, the, then there's Shapegrams as on, is the handle for Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Sounds good. Anything else that you would like to share with our listeners, Tony? Uh, no, I think check out what I, what I write on social media, because I think there's just so many great teaching tips that out there that, I, that I've collected particularly with, with pandemic teaching and the, the way that so many teachers have shifted their instruction, these tips are even more valuable. Thank you so much for your time, Tony. And thank you so much for sharing about your journey and the services that you provide and your thoughts on EdTech. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thanks for having me.